Hi, I'm Rora. Hi, I'm Jane. We are Birds of Clay. And this is Clay Connections, a short podcast series where we delve into the intersection of well-being, community, and of course, clay. In these conversations, we discuss lots of topics around mental health, and this is just a friendly reminder to reach out for support if you need. And that's okay if you do need, because as great and amazing as clay is, sometimes it can't do everything. Please check the show notes for links to supports that are out there. We would like to pay our respects to the traditional custodians on the lands on which this podcast is recorded. We acknowledge the rich history of art, craft and storytelling that has been occurring for millennia and acknowledge elders past, present and country as provider, protector and guide. Working with clay is intrinsically linked to country and we would not be here without the care and connection that our First Nations peoples have shown for thousands of years on this continent we call Australia. Hi, Rora. Hey, Jane. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. That's good. Yeah. This is exciting. Yeah, it is. Yes. So we're here and we're back. We are back. With a special series looking at well-being, community, clay and all the good things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be really fun. Um, Yeah. It will be good. Yeah. I don't know what to say now. Uh, okay, Jane. Why, why are we doing this little offshoot? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. It fulfills my assignment need for uni. No, <laughs> just joking. It is an element um, that I am doing for my uni. So as regular listeners will know, I'm studying a Bachelor of Creative Art and Community Wellbeing majoring in ceramics. So I'm really passionate about looking at the intersection of wellbeing, community and clay and using clay to improve wellbeing and build community. So it's something I feel really strongly about. And I think we have some amazing practitioners around at the moment. Um, So hopefully we get to talk to some of those in this little series. And um, yeah, just have a really good deep chat about all things related to that. So I've been kind of thinking a lot about this topic and thinking about this chat with you, Rora. Mm. And I think it was kind of... Our struggles are what brought us together a bit. I remember us both having some tough times in the studio and seeing each other through those. And I think it was those kind of times. And it wasn't just about clay. It was other personal stuff that was going on in our lives. But I feel like journeying together (laughs) through those times really brought us together. Yeah. So it's kind of nice that we're having this chat. It's kind of a bit full circle, it feels. This sounds really sappy, but when I did first meet you and you kind of asked me what my work was about. I know I've mentioned it briefly on here, but, and I kind of explained it was a bit mental health stuff, blah, blah, blah. And you had that look in your eyes, like you understood. It was a very uniting moment. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, we're immediately friends. (laughs) Yeah. And I think, look, I think there's a lot of people within the arts that do have ups and downs with mental health, for sure. Like I know for me, I was diagnosed quite young. Uh, with depression and anxiety, moderate depression and anxiety stuff. I it's fine. It's just part of who I am, and I manage it pretty well. But you do meet those people that you also feel connected with, and mm. yeah, I think for me, managing those things. Well, clay meeting clay was a big part to, of helping me manage those things. Yeah. So yeah, I relate to that. Yeah, yeah. It was only. I'm going to say two years ago, I went to the doctor and the doctor, you know, said, well, you have severe depression um, and asked me all those kind of questions to get to that point. And that was a confronting moment for me. But it was around that time we started to be friends or maybe a bit after that. And I started making work that was like very specifically about mental health and emotions and stuff and so clay's yeah everything it's a huge key to kind of unlocking that understanding of how my brain works in that way but yeah confronting being told you have depression 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Hey, and it's like, what does that mean? Does it mean medication? Does it mean yeah, treatments? Does it mean changing my life? And it's it could be all those things or none of them. <laughs> yeah, it's like just. I think the thing that's I've realized is it's just managing it and knowing that it's a part of who I am mm. and part of my journey and I need to I guess integrate that into my life is going yes I'll have ups and downs I'll have panic attacks I'll be anxious here but how do I manage that and not kind of I guess hype it into a disaster because yeah. I feel like sometimes I have bad mental health and then I go back and like I beat myself up for having bad mental health so it's like double bad mental health yes, <laughs> yes. there's so many layers <laughs> oh, there is there is but um yeah coming back to clay I think clay is an amazing medium to work in especially when we're processing emotions with it but I think the tactility of it is also very therapeutic and it is a diff- bit different though when clay starts becoming work yeah. Yeah. So I feel like clay can help us, but it can also challenge us mm. um, when we're making not just for fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were saying just before we started recording about how clay often enters our lives as a, a fun thing and a thing to unwind. And it's interesting going on that journey and then clay is this fun amazing thing that i do and then oh whoops whoops my whole life is about clay now (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's huge isn't it and um i think when clay becomes work which is one of the topics i've got written down Mm -hmm. when clay becomes work (laughs) (laughs) um our practice shifts a bit and this beautiful kind of medium and play that we found with clay um shifts into becoming a little bit more loaded and a little bit more complex. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess looking at that is like how do we manage ourselves and our well-being when clay does become work? And it, it comes down to that, I guess, idea of self-care. Yeah. Self-care <clears throat> is a big one. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot, self-care. So self-care isn't just a bubble bath. I feel like, you know, that's the kind of image people get. It's like, have a cup of tea and have a bubble bath. Which and, I, you know. And you'll be all better. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, those things are great, but it's more than that, isn't it's it? It's maintenance. Yeah, it mm-hmm. is. And um, I think the biggest thing that I need to learn around self care is my boundaries with my practice. So it's understanding when I have to work with clay Mm. and stopping that not doing it 24 7 like knowing this is when i'm working this is when i'm playing yeah and this is when i'm hanging out with my partner Mm -hmm. or doing something completely unrelated to clay it's funny having that kind of relationship with clay when the pressure kind of ramps up and it then becomes the avenue in which you make an income um, so I, I think for me, when that kind of became my life a few years ago, I had all this pressure that I was putting on myself because I felt like to justify taking this avenue as a job, I need to, uh, prove, prove it to myself that it's an okay choice um, because obviously it's a risk um, taking any kind of creative pathway it, there's no linear linear way there's going to be there's constantly choices you need to make constantly there's forks in the road there's I can go this way I can go that way and always questioning yourself am I making the right decision here um, and yeah just also proving to others that yes I'm a creative yes I'm an artist no it's not a frivolous lifestyle (laughs) yeah um actually yes I can make an income and that's yeah that's always gonna be something to develop as well and improve on 
Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. No, it's a lot. And I mean, I think <sighs> on that, there's the like, you, there's no set work hours. Yeah. So when do you start and end? Like, you, like I know I've been in a stage where I'll start at 6am in the morning and finish at 10pm at night for days on end. And that's not sustainable. No. And, you know, it starts out as your love, but then becomes this this chore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. I think when it gets like that too, you're doing it, you're convincing yourself, I love clay, yeah. I love clay, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and part of you does, but oh, it's complicated, it isn't it? It catches up yeah. on you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then it all kind of, once you get overworked and stressed, it all comes down like a ton of bricks. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the spiral that begins. <laughs> I know, I felt that definitely at the beginning of the year and I actually ended up making an artwork for uni about it um, where I felt just really burnt out at the beginning of the year after the Christmas rush and everything, you know, working five casual jobs and trying to sell functional wear and then make conceptual work and do exhibitions and it was just too many things. Even though I love all those things, it's just working out that balance and Mm -hmm. I think that's the hardest thing for a creative life is that you do often have like a lot of kind of freelance kind of projects going on and it's like balancing all that. So yeah, I was just really burnt out and I didn't want to make mugs and I didn't want to throw anything. So I just had some reclaimed clay and I just started pinching it and pinching out these little like worms, (laughs) I call them. (laughs) And that was really nice because it was taking me back to that initial love of the sensory feeling of clay between my fingers Mm. and it also like that squeezing I could feel pushing emotion out while I was doing it like kind of anger and you know like there's Mm. something I can even feel it now you guys can't see me but I am pushing my fingers together (laughs) squeezing the process and it was this really cathartic I guess coming back to my body and coming back to the materiality of clay and I loved that and I'm not sure why I'm saying that story, but I just think it's so true that as a creative, we really need to yeah. look after ourselves yeah. and understand that we can push ourselves too hard. Mm. I think it's yeah. good to bring yourself back and remind yourself of the initial joy the material sparked. Yeah. Yeah, because it's really easy to lose sight of that. Um yeah, when you just inundate yourself with a hundred jobs and <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. No, it's a good, good idea. It's something I always I keep thinking about is that idea of process and outcome. Because I feel like they're the two really big elements playing into our practice or into working with clay is like the process is where you start. It's like I remember being on the wheel, I just thought it was really fun. Mm. It was really, really fun. It was this hilarious, playful thing that I was doing with other people and I just would get in the flow and I loved it. It was all about the process. I actually didn't care about the outcome at all. And I think looking at um, art therapy and creative first aid practice, they are all about the process, not the outcome. Mm. And that's, I think, the difference between that kind of therapeutic use and then having an arts practice. But I don't know. I also think the outcome sometimes is undervalued. So the process is really important. And we know that that's really good for us. But I think there's an element of the outcome, especially, and this will probably lead into our next topic, is about making work about big stories or big emotions. So mm. I think we've both made work that, is about conceptually something like that so i think for those kind of pieces seeing that work come together like feeling those emotions while you're making but then seeing that work come together at the end and then sharing that work with other people and dialogue emerging once that work shared is actually really powerful yeah yeah actually um going back to process and outcome yeah when i started honors it's a real heavy focus on your practice and why you do what you do. What do you want to write about? And I actually thought maybe it, 
my practice is really in the process for me because it is personal and it is kind of going through those emotions and I started to question is the outcome for me the object is that more of a byproduct of a personal investigation um, how interesting yeah mm. I, I don't really know where I sit with that because now I kind of that's developed a little bit and I'm thinking about the you know the vessels at the end of the making I'm thinking about them as more of a tangible kind of manifestation of an emotion so mm. not so much a, a byproduct but an end product yeah interesting mm. yeah do you think um, you can make work that's too vulnerable for the world? Yeah. Yeah, I think I have done that. Yeah. But personally too vulnerable for yeah, me. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. what I mean yeah. for you. Because like, I think sometimes we have these big stories in us mm. and it's good to process them through making, but then maybe they're... It's like, how do you keep yourself safe when you're telling those big stories? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so I, throughout my bachelor's, made a lot of work reflecting on my experience with sexual assault. And, you know, as you kind of confront that, it's really hard and the work's kind of super ambiguous at the start. You don't want to directly kind of, well, in my experience, I didn't want to directly relate to it. I, it the, the themes kind of came out of me in the work um, accidentally, but that's obviously where, what I needed to be doing, what I needed to express. And a couple of years into making work about my experiences, I thought, okay, no, I'm really gonna confront the issue and do some text-based work with, you know, a quote from the experience. Um, and yeah, just some like very directly related pieces of text um i don't want to trigger anyone so i'm not going to say them here but i had three vessels each with text on them and they're very confronting to read and after that assessment piece i had to take them home and they sat in my studio and while they were the biggest pieces i'd made on the wheel uh, which i was proud of because that's what i wanted to do they were just sitting there staring at me in the face and any time someone came into mm. the studio you know it's not like an abstract piece of art where you can interpret it you literally look at the vessel read the words know exactly what it's about and kind of they throw you for a six you know so i turn them around in the studio face them to the wall um and yet yeah, look a month ago i just took them out to the smash pile and broke them because i didn't mm. want to carry them with me anymore just yeah, thought, I I don't want to explain them to people. I actually don't want to look at them. I don't need them, and they hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're big works, Rora. Like, yeah, they're the first works I saw that you'd made because oh, they're really? also in our graduate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were, yeah. and um, they're super powerful works, but very vulnerable. And yeah, I think sometimes work is meant to be made and then smashed <laughs> yeah yeah and then you know in those works is it then about the process not the product yeah mm. yeah would you go back and do that again no nah, i've moved on <laughs> yeah I, yeah i think i've kind of gone through those feelings and for me they're a lot easier to talk about now like initially i couldn't even yeah couldn't even speak about it of course yeah, yeah. and Took, I think I called that work six years later. That's actually how long it was. Yeah. Six years later. It takes a long time. Yeah. To even recognize. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Been, yeah. 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 Oh, thank you for sharing. Oh, no yeah. worries. If I've overshared, cut it. No, cut no, it. <laughs> it's not oversharing. Like, I think this is why we're having these chats. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, I think there's some works. When you start making things, the deep hurt mm. and the deep stories come out it's just choosing whether yeah to go hey world here's <laughs> my scars yeah you know and what level like i liked how you said the ambiguous mm. and i think that's something um i've told some stories not as big but around some health 
journeys through my work and they've been a bit ambiguous. Yeah. And it is interesting how much to share. I know you've made a work and then chosen not to put it into things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what, did you say it was too personal? Um, or you? They're my kidney trays, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. So a few years ago I had a hysterectomy and I have had a huge journey with um, my uterus <laughs> and issues around that and I made these works on all the surgeries I'd had and I think at the time when I made them it was really really raw and I actually pulled them out the other day and got some photos taken of them for the end of uni and I like them a lot more now they feel gentler and the raw emotion has shifted mm. It was actually interesting because the other work I did called Cycle, which was the cups around having my uterus removed. When I was in that space, having the photos taken, someone in that space had just had the same experience as me and they were asking what the work was about. And so then we got into this deep discussion about that experience and our shared experience. And I think we both felt a deep connection <laughs> through just having my artwork in this photography studio. So it was, that's cool. Like yeah. that's when art is doing the job I think yeah. it should do. Yeah. <laughs> it's Agreed. creating dialogue. And some of those dialogues are internal. Like it sounds like that work was dialogue you needed to have with yourself, mm. but you didn't need to have it with the rest of the world. Yeah, no. No, <laughs> no. Where I feel like some of those works I'm making, I'm ready to. Cool. I'm ready to have those conversations mm -hmm. and I want to make work that has that interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? These things. But how do you know? What, what's the the difference between being not ready and ready for you? What's what's kind of happened? Just the work ageing or has it been yeah. like the confrontation? Just distance and time, distance I think. Yeah. Time. Yeah. And also becoming more comfortable with myself as a storyteller in that medium, mm. I think. Um, which brings up a really good point, which is imposter syndrome, I think. Like, that's something I struggle with a lot. It's like, who am I to have this platform to tell this story? Like, should I even be making art? Mm. You know? Mm. And I think... The more I've been, got through uni and have been surrounded by not only excellent teachers but also other artists, I feel more sense of belonging in that space. So therefore, I feel like my works have become more. I've become more confident in them. Mm. That's good. Mm. I think imposter syndrome. Oh, I experience it too. Yeah. <laughs> I. That's. I don't know. I think everyone does. Yeah. I think it's one of those motivators, though. Yeah. If we didn't have it, would we ever try to be better? Yeah, or yeah. Or try to reach a new standard within our work? Um, I know it doesn't feel like a tool when we're experiencing it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I've always thought about it and thought, oh, I don't feel like I'm at that tier of artistry, so I'm just going to try and get there. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? It's that feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, like, it goes back to that idea of the process again. Is like, if the process makes you feel good, just make it and don't worry about where it's ending up. Yeah. It's different when it's your business, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like, I think I feel very confident making mugs and selling mugs. Because I've got good feedback, they're not very confronting. Mm. But then putting my work into art prizes, you know, it still gives me that sick belly feeling. Yeah, because you're submitting something to be judged. Yeah. And isn't that wild? Because we don't make art for the judgment of others. We make it for ourselves. But then actually submitting something with the expectation that someone's going to, okay, yes, you're a finalist, you've made it in, or no, actually your work 
isn't good enough. Imagine, imagine. Well, they don't say that your work's not good enough. <laughs> they but say if they you say, say like, uh, we've had an extraordinary number of applications yeah. this year. <laughs> every yeah. every rejection letter I've had recently, oh so like, we've been overwhelmed with the number of applications. Yeah, well, that's good for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you're just saying that to be nice. But when you make work about your feelings, it's almost getting like, meh. Not valid. <laughs> yeah, totally. Your feelings, not valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where I think, you know, there's a time and a place for art process and maybe it's not the place for a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. I think you yeah. kind of have to be in the right mindset when you're applying to something. Yeah. Um, speaking from experience of not being in the right mindset. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it's exactly that. It's, it's pretty vulnerable. Yeah. To... If you're feeling really vulnerable and um, worried when you're applying for something, probably don't do it. Yeah, and also, as you <laughs> said, like, when it's work that's deeply personal. And that's, I think, how I felt about those kidney trays is that they were work that I was processing something. And I found them quite confronting to look at. I don't think other people would because they were just red iron oxide on a porcelain kidney tray. But... um. Yeah, I didn't feel that they were just, oh, just throw them into this prize and this yeah. prize and see what happens. Like, um, yeah, I don't know where they're going to go, mm. or where they're going to sit. Yeah. But, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's how artwork just kind of, it's kind of like once you've made it, it's almost like its own little entity and it can grow or change or mm. die or it has, blossom. Yeah, or, yeah. it's yeah. like an object with soul. Yeah. Because you spend so much time with it in close proximity, literally manipulating it with your body and your movements. And it is very kind of fleshy and bodily as a material. And then, yeah, it's just like this tiny piece of you outside of your body. Yeah, it's mm, wild. That you created with the earth. Like yeah. It's this kind of co-creation. Yeah, and then it cracks in the kiln. And it's a <laughs> metaphor for a cracked heart. <laughs> I mean, that's a really good point. I think something I've learnt is I've learnt to be a lot more resilient um, through making things out of clay Um, because the failures are real. And you'll have this idea of what you're making and it's, like, meant to be this certain way and then it gets fired and it's totally different. It might be better, it might be worse, it might be just different, but you have to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. With change. Yeah. Which, you know, is a good metaphor for life. Yeah. It does for teach sure. us those things. Yeah. Sometimes there's so much failure and unmet expectations that when a work comes out of the kiln exactly how you thought, it's it brings so much joy. It's like, I did it! I mastered the clay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I yeah. won. Yeah. And then like a week later you notice it's got all like hairline cracks. No, just joking. Yeah. Oh wait. Yeah. It's oh, pinholes everywhere. Pinholed. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Clay. Clay, hey. <laughs> so I think it's interesting looking at the idea of community um in visual arts. So in my degree, I study with theatre students and musicians, and their practice is a lot more collaborative. Yeah. You know, it's you don't often have many theatre people just doing solo shows. True. They're usually performing with people, they're writing with people. Same with musicians. Like, yeah, you can play on your own, but most musicians play with other people mm. and I think visual arts really interesting for that because most of our making is done solo but we still and I think because of that sometimes we forget about the importance of a community around us so I've found I guess that we feel like I've got a bit of a community building around my practice and it's just kind of come about in the last year I'd say meeting you <laughs> and just really being involved in uni is probably the big thing um so yeah i'd probably call that a community of practice do you feel that oh yeah absolutely um i really felt it when i finished at uni and i experienced this loss of community it's like i i finished and okay over the past i guess 12 months of my degree i'd started 
working on my own home studio, getting that going. And I finished at uni and I didn't have a kiln. Um, I just had a wheel and some shelves. Um, and yeah, just figuring it out from there and going from having all these social conversations while I'm making, getting opinions from people um, and help. And then on my own with no community, I had a couple of friends from uni that I could message and hang out with occasionally. But um, yeah, it's, it, I guess I was grieving a little bit because I, I felt really, really lonely when I finished. Yeah. yeah it's and, reality, hey? Yeah. yeah. And then um, I've made some really good friends um, going back to uni, you, and attending workshops. Um, and that's been great. And going to events like Golgong. Yeah, yeah. Your friends there. Um, yeah, but I think you really need to remember to get out of the studio sometimes. Yeah. And that's really hard when you spend so much time alone in the studio and there's an opening one night and think, okay, I'm just going to completely talk myself out of going to this opening because one, I'm anxious. I'm too socially awkward. I'm too this, I'm too that. It's just so easy to do. It's going to take me an hour to get the clay out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm always like. Oh, and I don't like all my clothes are covered in clay. What yeah. can I wear? And, but it's true. It's you just more... rock up covered in clay. That's like yeah, the I most should... authentic thing you can do. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's true. It's the social anxiety and that. Yeah. Spending lots of time on your own and then putting yourself into a quite social, hectic yeah. environment. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I find I can talk myself out of so many things. Oh, yeah. When I'm just on my own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I go through stages where I do go to too many. Yeah. And then I go to none. <laughs> it's like you reach your quota for the year. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the story of my life. Too many things, not enough things. It's like, mm. yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely, I think, having those people. And it's, like, nice now because you go, are you going to the thing? And when yeah. I say no, you're like, yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> Yeah, I'm we not do doing that. Yeah, yeah. But having people that say, yeah, I'm going, you're like, oh, cool, do you know, I have dinner afterwards? Yeah. Or... Yeah. And I think that's really built, um, especially with our little group show that we had, like having people that you can be like, hey, do you want to do this project with, what do you think about this art prize? Oh, my goodness, I got rejected. Can mm. I cry with you? Mm. Um, I don't know. I think that's really important. It's important. I think our friends and family that aren't clay people don't understand 100%. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. you need those people that are in your field. They're like your work colleagues. They are. Yeah, that you can just be like, whoa, have you tried this new clay? It cracks. (laughs) Or, you know, like just people who get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Um, I was actually thinking... Oh, no, I was talking with Rachel about bringing our partners along to openings. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of saying, yeah, I don't need to bring Corey. He, one, he's not very interested um, <laughs> because he, he's like, he sees it about? and hears about it all when I'm with him anyway. Yeah. But also when I get there, I'm probably not going to talk to him much. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go off and spend time with my clay friends. Um so that's fine. There's obviously some non-negotiables, like, yes, you will be coming to my solo show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, friends and family that aren't clay people, they, they're they not really there. They're not obsessed and locked in like we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's important to have both. And, I mean, I think, I know you and I have spoken about this, is, like, let's also do things in our life that aren't about clay oh, sometimes. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we can get... You can get a little overwhelmed and a little bit in it. Yeah. 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 I'm talking when I say you, I mean me. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm nodding because (laughs) yes, I agree. (laughs) Yes, I agree. You, not me. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, those those community practices are really important. And also, like, I think it's really important to celebrate with people. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than getting, like, I got accepted into this thing and telling, like, your partner and they're like, oh, that's good. (laughs) <laughs> and you're like, no, but it's more and let's go and do something or celebrate yeah. and, yeah. you know, like yeah. I think 
if I went and told you that, you'd be like, oh my God, that makes this. And, you know, you'd get it. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. Not that our partners will listen, but love you. (laughs) (laughs) So I think, you know, on that community thing, something that I know you have started doing recently and I have also started doing recently is teaching. (gasps) Yeah. Because teaching is its own little kind of strange world, isn't it? Mm. yeah and something I've really noticed is and this is I guess one of those ideas I have when I'm thinking about research is how having those casual classes like the beginner wheel class the three hours play with clay classes well-being comes up a lot in those and especially I'm finding this pattern where I'm getting lots of kind of mums with little ones that are finding they want to get back to their own identity. They want to break from that identity as mum mm. and do something creative where they have a little bit of time to themselves. And that is a pattern I'm seeing across everywhere I'm teaching. Yeah. And they're saying that, like, one of my beautiful students said last week, they said, this two hours is my favourite two hours of the week and I look forward to it all week. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah, and I mean, I could say it's all me, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're creating that space. Well, we're holding space, and I think this sounds a bit wild, but I think clay allows you to hold space. Yeah. Like, I think there's something about, particularly the wheel, like learning to centre it, learning all those processes. You actually have to be quite centred yourself. You can't come in and get angry at the clay. No. And try and force it. No. We've been there and we know it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does, it's like kind of, you know, they talk about um, working with horses. Horses reflect your inner emotions. And I think clay's a bit like that. Mm. Some days you just won't be able to centre because you're not centred. And there's so much going on that you actually need to go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. Or you need to just get out of your head and then come back. Mm -hmm. and but when you are centered and you are playing with clay and and throwing that pot all those worries are gone Mm -hmm. you're just there with the clay yeah you and the clay are creating something together Mm -hmm. and i think that's a really special unique thing (laughs) Yeah. yeah that's that makes a lot of sense um i kind of feel like with you know, making emotional work, being at the wheel is when I can think about those things and really go in on my, on my mind and just, okay, Rora, I've got this, this work, um, where I was thinking about my own double standards that I have and that exist, um, where I'll hold myself to a standard and others to a different standard. And that's quite confronting <laughs> to like think about your flaws and, and how to work on them and um, how you can be unfair to others and, you know, other, other emotions as well. But when I'm at the wheel, I'm not uh, critiquing myself. I'm just thinking about how, how it is, how I am and how I can work on it and why it is the way it is. It's like, safety i'm not Mm -hmm. i'm not degrading myself i'm not talking down to myself i'm just thinking about how i am because it is what it is and how i can work on it that's so interesting yeah yeah it's like it's like what you said that like background noise just kind of goes away Mm. Mm. i feel like you've trained yourself to do that though that's really really? cool yeah maybe maybe not maybe (laughs) it sounds like it's a really interesting process that you've really because I mean I don't know sometimes I'm on the wheel and I don't even remember being there I just kind (laughs) of check out (laughs) you just go into autopilot yeah yeah Yeah. dissociate no (laughs) (laughs) no I think it's just I don't know I can I do know I can be really hard on myself and those days are when everything flops and everything goes in the bucket when I'm like you're terrible at this. Why are you even trying? Everyone else is so much better. And yeah. Yeah. I think I've got better at kind of 
stopping that getting out of control, that, that self-talk. But Good. It does pop up every now and again. It's usually when I haven't been on the wheel for a while or if my body's sore or... Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's another big thing that we could talk about for ages is the physical well-being. Because oh. working with clay is quite physical, but... Do you um, ever um, ignore those aches and pains? Oh, yeah. 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 Push through them? Yeah, and then I can't walk. Hmm. <laughs> or I'm like stiff, crazy person. Um, yeah, no, it does take me... Yeah, I definitely, I definitely push through those feelings. And, I mean, I don't know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Sometimes it's a bad thing, but sometimes... Mm. You just get so into working with clay. Yeah. Yeah. The way I think about being on the wheel, I guess there's a lot of parallels drawn with the challenges that the wheel presents that you overcome and you set yourself new goals every week. And then when I was really depressed, I kind of drew some parallels there. There were things I was thinking about myself that I needed to overcome and kind of get to the center of and stop telling myself I was all those awful things and in the same way that you kind of master a pull like I don't know you just have to get rid of the stuff that doesn't work in order to work I don't know. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. Nah. Nah. <laughs> I'm kind of with you, but yeah. It's like overcoming physical um, barriers on the wheel and overcoming mental barriers in the mind. Oh, at the yeah, same time. yeah. 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 And they kind of, there's a synergy, you see. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just thinking about having a sore back from sitting at the wheel all day. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, doing, like when I was really in the, in the groove, I'd do yoga every morning and like go for a walk in the middle of the day and it'd just like break up my making, which was really important. Get some sunlight on the skin. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Get out of the moldy laundry. Um, yeah. Mm, Yeah. Got to get outside. I'm finding that that, um, is kind of turning me around a bit like I was at the point where I was just so stiff my whole body was so stiff because I was dedicating literally every single day of the week to making or teaching or you know whatever to do with clay hunching over a computer doing the website and just doing it from you know dawn till dusk and that's like you said not sustainable (laughs) <laughs> and now I'm getting outside and it's just I'm finding it easier to put those boundaries in. Yeah. On the making boundaries. Time. It's so important. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is important. Yes, boundaries. I think um that is the key to a sustainable arts practice and balance mm. of it all. Because, yeah, I'm not going to say work life because clay is life. We know that. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But boundaries is what allows you to say no to things you don't want to do, to design a practice where you feel that all your needs are met, which I guess is what well-being is. Like good well-being is having your physical needs met, your emotional needs, your spiritual needs, your financial needs all those needs. I'm sure there's many more I've forgotten, but mm. yeah. And so how do you put boundaries in? Mm. Well, I think largely I'm still learning my boundaries. Um, I mean, that's a good point. You need to know what they are. Yeah. I feel like you need to go too far in one direction before you know where that line has to be drawn. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, though. Experiential learners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess when you're making and you're trying to make a financial uh, turnaround on your practice, you say yes to every commission that comes your way. Um, 
And something I'm realizing that might be a personal boundary for me is anything... It's interesting. A lot of the commission work I've done over the past few years, they always have problems. Mm. Um, They always have cracks. Mm -hmm. They are the things I need to make multiple times to make it work. And that's not sustainable for me. But I've been asking myself, why is that? Why is that? And I realized I think it's um, the energy I'm putting into the work. I'm thinking about what I must get done rather than what I what what kind of work my soul was being called to. It's like, oh, no, I'm doing yeah. this as a, as a means to make money rather than expressing myself. I don't yeah, know. It's, it's those, weird, isn't it? It's something yeah. about a commission that drains all joy out of making for me. Yeah. It, like it every becomes time I'm like, a deadline. I know, but like I'm okay with deadlines if it's like I have to make 20 mugs yeah. for the market. Yeah. I'm like, okay, fun. Yeah. Well, kind of. <laughs> but if I'm like, I need to make this certain mug for this thing and they've already paid me, mm. I'm kind of like, ugh. <laughs> like, I hate it. Yeah. Why? Like, it's not... But, yeah. But maybe it's... I guess there's... We're artists mm. and there's... Our, our, exp- our freedom of expression and our choice for the for the thing that we're making is taken away because we've been given like an idea of what they want or it can be really specific like I need a mug that says happy birthday dad or yeah, yeah. you know it's not it doesn't then feel authentic yeah, yeah yeah it's true and I think I pretty much say no to all commissions yeah yeah that's something and, I need to do. Yeah, because for me, I don't find the joy in them. And look, I know I have to also be realistic around work. And I mean, I made, um, I did a, a wholesale commission, which was great. I mm. really enjoyed doing that. That was the 30 incense trays. And they were easy to make. Um, the lovely lady I worked with was super easy to work with. Great. We had a good price like it was just simple and easy and she's like do whatever you want which is good and bad sometimes but I said what about this and this and she's like great do it so you know (laughs) it was just simple and they were very easy to make and yeah yeah but when people are like oh and then maybe this but then maybe can you do it this color and then a bit higher and that's when I'm just like nah Mm, yes yes um something our lovely friend Peter has suggested to me Mm. um in lieu of some recent issues I've had with commission work is doing up a contract yeah at the start um my issue's kind of been in progress so sending a picture and then them kind of being like, no, actually, can you do it this way? Like, oh, well, the work's done. <laughs> yeah. You're like, no, um, I can't. <laughs> yeah. So maybe something in the contract Peter suggested was, uh, you know, once the design sketch is done and the design is agreed upon, um, that's it. Like, no changing, no refunds from then on because... Well, I don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. except just boundaries. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I mean, boundaries. I think these are the things like, what would you say is the thing that keeps you up at night in your ceramic practice? Like, what's the thing <sighs> that you worry about and keeps you up at night? Oh, there's a few things. <laughs> yeah. Getting enough done. Yeah, yeah. Always getting enough done. Um, Right now, I'm, my mind kind of sw- is swimming a bit with probably a few too many things because I'm at the uni studio, the Darling Down studio, and my own because I'm thinking about what needs to be done in each one. Yeah, yeah. And I do find it hard to walk away from one studio and not think about the other one or the other one. (laughs) I think I'm just thinking about all of them at the same time. It's hard to leave one and forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, I'm a bit the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I find it when your practice is spread across different places. And, I mean, that's the beauty of, of uni and, you know, community clubs is that you have those people around you. Mm. But for me, that's also a distraction. Yeah. 
and I can get a bit wobbly in those spaces and lose track of what I'm doing while at home I can keep really good Mm. track of things so trying to kind of decide where I'm going to make and where I'm going to fire because you don't also want to be moving greenware like from (laughs) yeah Aurora (laughs) you don't want to be moving greenware with spikes (laughs) that are easily knocked off Um, you don't want to be moving them to a kiln from another studio so it's just a lot of logistics and I think that's probably the thing that keeps me up at night is balancing everything so many logistics yeah I would say I spend like 20% of my time looking at my diary and writing things down and sending emails like logistics is probably 20% of my workload it's so good that you actually like do that and write things oh I'd have to I keep buying journals yeah and not using them yeah, look, if you can keep it all in your head, great, but I could not. Like, oh, I can't. You can't, no. <laughs> Bullet journals are pretty good. I think my notes app on my phone has been yeah. my saving grace sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Just doing those little to-do lists. Yeah. Um, sometimes planning out a week and doing a to-do list for every day. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, like the lo- logistics of things, like, oh, I've got to go to the pottery supplies to get this. And then once I have this, I can then do this, which means I can put that glaze on this piece, which then I could fit into this firing with that work. It's, like, just crazy. I know. It's another part of of working with ceramics. We have a lot of transferable skills. Like, we would be great to employ in any industry. Time management, juggling of many things, logistics, all of it. (laughs) Yeah. Too bad we never want to change industry. It's true. (laughs) I don't know. depends on how the kill went (laughs) that day. Sometimes I'm like, I'm giving up. How do you overcome those days when you think you want to give up? Have a break. And I think that's a really big thing is like, I'm like, go harder. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm like, no, like just walk away. Mm -hmm. Go have a couple with someone. Go to a gallery. They're the things that fill me up. Like I love having you know, brekkie out with friends or family. I love going for a good bush walk. I love going to the gallery, especially down in Brizzy. Like, I find going to Brisbane just clears my head. Mm. Um, seeing friends. Even just picking up the phone, having a chat to a friend. Just something that's not related to the kiln. Yeah. But, I don't know. And then it's getting back in and just, like, I letting go and moving forward. Yeah. 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 What about you? Well, recently, so my, this will make sense in a second, but my aunt and uncle live next door across the paddock and they're opal miners. So they're away for six months of the year out west mining in winter. So now they have a one-eyed horse, Blaze, and recently we have just become the most unlikely best friends and I've been going out every morning giving him cut up apples, um, carrots, hay, and brushing his mane. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's and really lovely. Yesterday, I just got his mane, the best I've ever gotten it, and I put five plats in it, and I just thought, this is living. <laughs> That's so nice. And I think, like, for you, your animals are really important. Hey. Yeah. Like, yeah. I need to have time in the day to connect with animals. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, when I'm up in Toowoomba, two and a half days a week I don't get those that animal time and I come mm. home Wednesday afternoon and I'm just so sooky <laughs> <laughs> and I just cuddle my dogs and go yeah. brush the horse and up yeah down and that's yeah. good and I think you know it's so not good to know that to know what are the things that fill your cup mm. when you've had a hard kill mode <laughs> or you know you're just feeling it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yay to animals yay to animals yeah and then also, like, having those friends that you can whinge to without feeling like you're a whinger. Yeah. Like, yeah. I know I can whinge to you. Yeah. We're good for Till the cows yeah. come home. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice, isn't it? And I think that's really, that's changed my practice. Like, having a friend that you can be like, oh, why has the glaze done this? Yeah. <laughs> and you'd be like, well, it could be this or this, but also just cry with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you don't need solutions. You just need someone to listen and say, that's shit. 
I'm exactly. sorry that happened to you. Yeah, mm. yeah. So if you're out there and you're feeling lonely, try and get yourself a clay buddy and know mm. that we're also here for you. And just know that other clay people need buddies too, so don't feel like you can't reach out. Yeah, so true. And this is something that I've been thinking about, obviously because we do a podcast, <laughs> is how when I was alone, I actually found a lot of connection in listening to podcasts like listening to mainly american podcasts yeah and just hearing those guys go through their ups and downs of life and making with clay and creative lives because creative lives are dynamic (laughs) (laughs) and i think they really helped me just feel like someone was there Mm. yeah it's far better having for real friends (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, hopefully our podcast will be that for some people who are isolated and can't talk to someone else about clay. We've had a couple of messages. Oh, we've had the most beautiful messages. That have said that along those lines that um, it's so good to hear the ups and downs um, and feel like I'm in the studio with you two while I'm making... Yeah. How cool is oh, that? Oh, it's so cool. That's exactly what we wanted. I know. And it's a, <laughs> like, I think this is something that for me is a theme or a thread that runs through all this is that connection. Yeah. You know, like connection is really important. Connection with the material, connection with other people, connection, connecting your practice. Like, I just think that's it. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really at the center of our lives. Yeah. Clay. Yeah. And, yeah, it does get too intense sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's good to remind each other sometimes when we're being too intense. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, I think that's it. Um, Thanks, Rora. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for having me. (laughs) It's been great chatting. And, um, yeah, we've got some interviews coming, so that'll be really exciting. Yes. Woohee. Yeah. Stay tuned. (laughs) Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed. You can find us on Instagram at birdsofclay underscore podcast. Please feel free to send us any questions or comments. And if you could leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on, that would be amazing. We'll see you next time.